Welcome back. This is a two-part series discussing about spin in quantum mechanics. This may be cruel, but I just have to say it at the start of this video. Spin is non-intuitive and cannot be understood intuitively. This is because spin is much more fundamental than our senses. Quantum mechanics doesn't care if it doesn't align with our intuition. It will accurately describe the reality nonetheless. There is no simple explanation of spin without losing too much rigor. However, I will show you how to cunningly recover the classical picture of an object spinning about its own axis via the quantum interference of a vast number of states of well-defined spin. So without further ado, let's get started. To understand spin, we must first understand angular momentum in quantum mechanics. Classically, angular momentum is the momentum of an object in circular motion. It is mathematically defined as a cross product of position and momentum vectors. However, there's a more fundamental way to define angular momentum. That is, angular momentum is the generator of rotation. Mathematically, it is written as r of alpha equals to e to the minus i alpha dot j over h bar. r is the rotation operator. It rotates our system about an axis. The rotation axis is in the same direction as vector alpha. j is the angular momentum operator a vector operator, which consists of three operators, jx, jy, and jz. I have divided through by h-bar, which has the unit of angular momentum, to ensure the exponent is dimensionless. We shall set h-bar to 1 for the rest of this video, for convenience. The commutation relations directly follows, because of the symmetry of space. The commutator of ji and j squared equals to 0, where i can be x, y, or z. J squared is the total angular momentum squared, which is also Jx squared plus Jy squared plus Jz squared. When the commutator vanishes, both observables represented by the operators can simultaneously be measured precisely. In this case, the total angular momentum and the angular momentum along one axis can be simultaneously measured precisely. This is nothing surprising to us, but what is surprising is this statement. The commutator of Ji and Jj equals to i summed over k, epsilon i, j, k, j, k, where each of the i, j, and k can be x, y, or z. The epsilon is called a levi civita symbol. It is a simple object, and it is here to exploit the cyclic symmetry of the relationships between angular momentum operators. Epsilon is plus one for even permutations of x, y, z. Epsilon is minus one, for odd permutations of x, y, and z. Epsilon is zero if any of the two indices are the same. For example, the commutator of jx and jy is i epsilon x, y, z, j, z equals to i, j, z because epsilon x, y, z equals to plus one. The commutator of j, z and j, y equals to i epsilon z, y, x, j, x equals to minus i, j, x because epsilon z y x equals to minus 1. Because of the two angular momentum operators in different directions don't commute with each other, this implies it is impossible to measure the angular momentum in x and y directions simultaneously and precisely. It is a profound result and has far-reaching consequences. The next step is to extract the spectrum of angular momentum because angular momentum is quantized in quantum mechanics. We begin by stating the eigenvalue equations where we have labeled the simultaneous eigenstate with two eigenvalues, where beta is the eigenvalue of j squared and m is the eigenvalue of jz. The choice of jz over jx and jy is by convention. It is equally valid to choose jx or jy. Remember how we extracted the energy spectrum in a quantum harmonic oscillator by introducing the ladder operators? The ladder operators were the creation and annihilation operators the eigenvalue equation we were trying to solve is the time-independent Schrodinger equation. We will now use almost the identical strategy to extract the spectrum of angular momentum. We first define the raising operator j plus and lowering operator j minus by the following equations. It is important to realize that j plus and j minus are Hermitian conjugates of each other, which directly follows from the definition. Then, we evaluate the commutators involving the ladder operators. Both ladder operators commute with j squared. 
Therefore, the latter operators cannot change the total angular momentum, but both do not commute with Jz. We're now armed with commutators and are finally prepared to extract the spectrum. Using the raising operator, the procedure is as follows. Apply the raising operator on both sides of the eigenvalue equation of Jz. J plus pass through the number m by linearity on right hand side. On left hand side, J plus can be swapped with Jz if we add in a commutator, substitute the previously evaluated commutator and rearrange to get this final equation. Comparing this equation with the eigenvalue equation of eigenvalue m plus 1 yields the final result. The raising operator increases the eigenvalue m by 1 and produces another eigenstate of Jz. The procedure is identical for lowering operator. The result is J minus decreases m by 1 and produces another eigenstate of Jz. Thus, we have obtained a ladder just like the quantum harmonic oscillator case. We now need to consider whether it is possible for the ladder to continue infinitely on both sides. We can algebraically prove that the ladder must have a top run and a bottom run. But here's an equally valid physical argument. Each time we use the raising operator J+, we reorientate the angular momentum vector such that it becomes more aligned with the z-axis. And even at a maximum alignment, the component of the angular momentum onto the z-axis cannot be more than the total angular momentum. And this argument can be repeated for the lowering operator. Each time we use the lowering operator, we reorientate the angular momentum vector such that it becomes more aligned with the negative z-axis. And again, the component of the angular momentum onto the z-axis cannot be more than the total angular momentum. Therefore, the ladder must have a top run and a bottom run. Through some algebra, we could show that the ladder is symmetric in the sense that the maximum m is the negative minimum m. In addition, we can show that beta equals to j, j plus 1, where j is the maximum m. We'll also relabel our eigenstates from beta m to j m as we can directly deduce the eigenvalue of j squared from the j label. We have now completely extracted the spectrum of angular momentum along one axis in quantum mechanics. j can only be integers or half integers because the raising operator must be able to raise the angular momentum projection from minus j to j in integer number of applications. And m is between j and minus j because j is maximum m by definition. So here's a summary of the results we have established so far. The angular momentum in one component commutes with the total angular momentum squared. Therefore, it is possible to simultaneously and precisely measure the total angular momentum and the component of the angular momentum along one of the axes. However, the angular momentum in two orthogonal directions do not commute, but gives the angular momentum operator in a third orthogonal direction. Therefore, it is impossible to simultaneously and precisely measure the angular momentum in two axes that are orthogonal to each other. Angular momentum in one of the axes is quantized and forms a ladder, and the distance between the run of ladder is 1 h-bar. It is not possible to perfectly align the angular momentum such that it is parallel to the z-axis, and this is because the eigenvalue of the j-squared operator is j, j plus 1, instead of the value j squared. But as we increase the total angular momentum, the alignment gets better. j is called the total angular momentum. It simultaneously generates translation on a circle and reorientates the object. Therefore, j can be decomposed into two parts. First part, orbital angular momentum L, is the generator of circular translation, but does not change the orientation of the object. Second part, spin angular momentum, which reorientates the object, but does not translate the object in space. This is quite a dangerous picture, but we can recover some intuition from this, so it is useful. I have denoted the orientation of the object with a blue arrow and the location of the object on a circular path with a green arrow. As you can see, orbital angular momentum is associated with translation on a circular path. Spin angular momentum is associated with the orientation of the object and the total angular momentum is associated with both, as if the object is placed on a turntable.
Mathematically, J equals to L plus S. An important fact is that all three angular momentum operators have the same commutation relation. Therefore, they have the same spectrum. The orbital angular momentum L must have integer values. We can prove this result algebraically, but an equally valid physical argument is that when the orientation of the object is unchanged, the object must return to its original state after integer number of revolutions on a circular path. However, spin quantum number s can either be integer or half integer. For example, electron is spin one half. This means the state of the electron does not return to its original state after one entire rotation, but the negative original state. This is extremely unintuitive, and the reason are as follows. Particles are described by fields in quantum field theory. Fields with half integer spin can never obtain macroscopic values. Our intuition of rotation is a consequence of our daily interaction with fields that can obtain macroscopic values, namely the electromagnetic field, which has spin equals to 1, and the gravitational field, which has spin equals to 2. If we have these hands-on interactions with these half-integer fields, for example, the Dirac fields, it would be very obvious to us that an object doesn't have to return to its original state after one entire rotation. This concludes the part one of this discussion of spin. We have laid a solid foundation of spin, and we are at the position to understand how spin encodes the orientation of an object in quantum mechanics. And we're also at the position to recover the classical intuition of a spinning object by interfering vast number of states of well-defined spin. See you in part two.